This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome to Audible Bleeding. Uh, today we are going to have a panel on uh, paclitaxel, and we have two experts with us. Uh, we have Dr. Darren Schneider, who is the Chief of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at New York Presbyterian Hospital Wheel Cornell Medical Center. He completed his training and was on faculty at the University of California, San Francisco, and has extensive experience in minimally invasive procedures and research interest in the design and development of endovascular devices for the treatment of aortic aneurysms and peripheral arterial disease. We are also honored to have uh, Dr. Joseph Mills, who is a professor in chief of the Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy at Baylor College of Medicine. He has held numerous leadership positions in vascular surgery and is the co-editor for Rutherford's Vascular Surgery and is most well known for his work in developing the Wi-Fi wound criteria for critical limb ischemia. Welcome to Audible Bleeding. Thank you. Good morning. This is Matt Smith. Dr. Mills and Dr. Schneider both recently participated in the Vascular Leaders Forum uh, on drug elution in peripheral artery disease, or PAD. It was a critical analysis from multi-specialty consortium on March 1st and 2nd, 2019. And we're here today to kind of get the state of the art on the what's going on with these PACL taxol created devices. So um, Dr. Mills, maybe we'll start with you. Can you start us off on just letting us know like how long these devices have been used in the periphery? Well, the device has been around for a long time. So what's interesting is that it started out being used in the coronary system. Um, it's, a, it's a chemotherapeutic drug, right? It's mostly used for cancer. And most of the cancers it's used for, with the exception of breast cancer, are highly lethal cancers. So it'd be unlikely you'd detect any, any long-term complications of these drugs, except perhaps in women with breast cancer, which we can talk about later. But anyway, the coronary system has pretty much switched away from paclitaxel, because at least in the coronaries, there was a higher incidence of stent thrombosis, for example, and most of the coronary work has switched over to everolimus. But anyway, because of the way things develop, when paclitaxel first came out for the heart, people started looking at it for the periphery. So that's pretty much, with a few exceptions, that's most of what we have for peripheral use now for balloons and stents is paclitaxel. Before the release of this paper, how commonly were these used and, and, and how were you using them in your practice? In the U.S. at least, I think they were pretty widely used. There had been some, some data that suggested at least the target le lesion revascularization rate was better. We can argue about what that means. And there were a couple, for example, the silver PTX trial that actually showed better patency. So I think my impression in the U.S. and in many parts of Europe was many people had switched to these at least for task C and D lesions, is certainly not for every lesion, but because the benefit was to prevent restenosis and to prevent uh, having to do another procedure on the patients. So I think it was pretty widely used. In our practice, <clears throat> except for very simple lesions, we tended to use drug technology. And Dr. Schneider, what about you? What were your use of these devices prior to all this research coming out? I think in the United States, certainly because of availability of devices, we lagged a little bit behind Europe, but I think we quickly kind of uh, replicated what they were doing in Europe, and that was a shift to try to use more of these uh, drug eluding, uh, uh, drug delivery therapies in an effort to reduce uh, stenting. And so, you know, the strategy kind of shifted from where we were doing uh, bad things like full metal jackets for patients uh, to where we tried to, to do more uh, angioplasty with drug delivery and only use uh, spot stenting when necessary to reduce uh, uh, stent use. And I think that that model uh, kind of did catch on and has largely been adopted in the United States. And so that's part of, part of why... Uh, uh, this new controversy with paclitaxel is such a big issue in terms of practice in the United States now. Dr. Mills, you know, maybe we could ask you to give just a synopsis of the uh, findings from Dr. Katsanos and his colleagues that they published in the Journal of American Heart Association that's led to this discussion. Would that be okay? There were a couple of studies that actually showed possibly a trend towards increased mortality in the paclitaxel group, but they Generally, and this was individual studies, weren't statistically significant, and they were usually dismissed as just an aberration. So what Katsanos did was he took, I believe there were, he started out with 28 or so randomized prospective trials where either paclitaxel balloons or stents were used and looked at all-cause death. 
and it's he, he looked at the actual published trials and looked at the attention to treat basis. So if you were randomized to drug elution, you got that, you, you that's what you were assigned to it statistically and vice versa. So anyway, um, at one year, there was no different. Now, what was interesting about these trials is that they were predominantly claudicates. So unlike most of our practices, I think 89, almost 90% of these patients in these trials were claudicates. But so what they found when you weed through all that, there were 12 or so studies at the end of two years that still had adequate follow-up. And by then, the TAC, Paclitaxel group had almost doubled the mortality. So it was over 7% versus, I think, 3.8. And then by the time he got to five years, it was 14.7% mortality versus 8%. Now, in that, there were only three trials left that had follow-up that far. They even calculated the number needed to harm, basically, would be 14 patients. So that was kind of shocking because something that we adopted um, that we thought was helping patients by extending their patency potentially could have um, adverse effect on mortality. And particularly those of us that are conservative with claudicans, it's kind of shocking as a clinician that something we were doing to try to help patients could possibly have increased their, their two to five year mortality. So that's, that's basically what his study showed. And Dr. Schneider, I know a lot of the uh, criticism of this paper, especially when it initially came out, was that this is just a meta-analysis. It wasn't designed to detect this. None of the studies are designed to detect this. What do we think about that? Now? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that the initial kind of knee-jerk reaction was to say that this is a meta-analysis. It's not utilizing patient-level data. Uh, we're not sure we really believe this. There's no clear mechanism that's known that could explain the findings. And so I think a lot of uh, 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 physicians really wanted to, to dismiss this. And the problem is that uh, I think despite a lot of people in a lot of in industry and other people hoping that this would just uh, go away, it, it hasn't. And, and people really haven't been able to, uh, to eliminate this concern now about paclitaxel. So, Dr. Mills, looking at this study, um, you know, I think a lot of people were dismissing it uh, initially, but the FDA came out and, and we can talk about that a little bit more in a second and said that there is real signal here. Uh, what parts of the study do you take away that are that really stuck out to you as, as a true signal of a possible uh, a possible problem here? Well, so you have to understand that the strongest levels of evidence, if, if you're an evidence based expert is a is a meta-analysis of prospective randomized trials that includes uh, patient level data <clears throat> so that's the highest level of evidence that's ex accepted by uh, medical evidence experts so this study is actually the next highest level of evidence which is randomized uh, prospective trials that are on which a meta-analysis is done but they used just the published paper so you don't have all the depth of information about the patients and the subgroups in that type of analysis as you would if you had all the individual patient level data. So anyway, the deniers kind of don't seem to understand the power of statistics really, because the whole point of meta-analysis is really to take a large number of studies, assuming you agree with the entry criteria, so were they appropriately randomized, and all this is done in a standard way. Then you can actually generate conclusions that wouldn't be possible looking at individual studies because the power is not high enough, right? So when you do that, they showed a difference. And they also, now the thing that's controversial, and I've heard multiple sides of this, including at Viva, is how they calculated the dose. So uh, there were a couple speakers at Viva that addressed that. And in some situations, not all, but in some situations, there's detectable paclitaxel in people for months to years after it's put in. Now it's really small dose. So the way paclitaxel is used in the periphery is it's attached to something because otherwise when it's used for breast cancer, it's it's soluble. So you get a really high exposure, but it's cleared quickly because it's in a soluble form. To put it on a balloon or a stent, you have to create a mechanism where it lasts longer and gets taken up by the endothelium. So anyway, it turns out it can last longer than we thought. But the way he calculated dose was highly debated. So he looked at the length of the balloon or the length of the stent and assumed it was possibly there for the whole duration of the patient's follow-up. And it's not clear how true that is. And then most of the people that, that are scientists in this area said, well, even if it's still there, it's a tiny dose. So what's really unclear, I think, is the mechanism. But as we discussed at FIVA also, just because we don't understand the mechanism yet doesn't mean that there might not be one.
But I think that's where people got hung up because it's still not totally clear how this might play out if it's true. I mean, the authors make a persuasive argument when you read the paper about their dosing and the fact that they found that there is a uh, increased risk the, with that's that correlates with the dose exposure. Um, I know that you've you've just spoken about what the what the the counter argument to that is, but what's your gut feeling? You think it's real or not? I think it probably is. I mean, in, in, at least what's interesting is if you look at the response on this side of the Atlantic versus Europe, they're dramatically different. So it's almost like climate deniers or whatever. But in Europe, the the Tweed PAD trial and the uh, Basel trials were put on hold, and they weren't worried about this. And in the U.S., at least, the first response from the FDA was kind of muted. Well, we still think this is safe. It's been approved. Of course, have a discussion with your patients, but not too worried yet. We're going to look into this. And then when they did the analysis, of, so with what the FDA did, and this came out at Viva, but it wasn't it was difficult to get out of them until a few of us started asking questions. But basically, they they analyzed the data they had, um, which is different than the data that's published, right? Because they have pre-approval data that gets sent to the FDA. So they have more information than we do. And they actually, at least statistically with the available data, they confirmed that there was a mortality signal. So this then they sent this letter out. I believe it was about seven to 10 days ago. It was somewhere in mid-March that that said, again, interpret this with caution, but um, maybe you should consider other alternatives for your patients. So they haven't said don't use it at all, but it's come out a little bit more strongly. So I find that kind of interesting. Looking at the initial Kitsanos paper, the initial reaction, and then as we've learned more and the FDA has presented their analysis, I think it's become more and more compelling to me that, that this, this is a real finding. Uh, and that there should be significant concern about using paclitaxel as we have been uh, in the periphery. And, and the reason that I've kind of come to that conclusion is not only the Ketsanos paper, but the FDA statement when they looked at data that they had access to, which, which I believe is uh, individual patient level type data uh, that was part of the U.S. pivotal trials. And then actually going back to the coronary literature, you know, if you go back to some of the randomized trials between the uh, Limus and Paclitaxel eluding stents, like for instance in the uh, SPIRIT trial, at five years there's a significant mortality signal that's not related to instant thrombosis for the Paclitaxel devices in the coronaries as well. And at five years, the all-cause mortality is about double in those trials. So it's the exact same thing now that we're seeing years later in the periphery. So coupled together, you know, uh, uh, that really has made me concerned that this is a, a real finding and that we have to take it seriously and that we probably are going to have to change practice as a, as a consequence. And the dosage in the periphery tends to be much higher than dosage in coronary. Is that, that that's also what I've learned about this? Is that correct? Well, it's true because uh, uh, you know you only have uh, so much uh, surface area of a stent of a coronary stent compared yeah. to a peripheral balloon or stent. So the doses, even if the concentration is similar, the uh, yeah. the total dose is going to be higher in the periphery. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's funny. It's, it's, it's actually may be good in some ways. So. The coronary circulation moved away from this quite a while ago, and it was like what we were stuck with because the randomized trials were, had already been started, right? Mm -hmm. And so this signal got lost, and most people assumed that the difference was because the coronary stents were smaller and you had a higher stent thrombosis. But this actually could do two things. It could make us look at the mechanism better, and it could also maybe switch us to now looking for different drugs that have, have a better effect, perhaps. Because one of the problems with these studies is, is it's, too much, it's too much to go through all 28 of them. But in many of them, the endpoint was target legion revascularization, right? So that's I mean, it's a signal. If you're trying to see it, does this does this drug or device prevent restenosis? Then you got to do a study designed to look at that. But to me, that's one of the weakest endpoints. So, Dr. Mills or Dr. Schneider, at your Vascular Leaders Forum uh, that you guys were at. Is there is there any mechanisms that are being proposed or even you know hypothesized as the reason for mortality associated with this? It's not clear, and there really is no known mechanism for sure to explain this, and that's been one of the dilemmas and one of the reasons that people have wanted to dismiss this signal as not necessarily being real because nobody can clearly explain the mechanism, or if there is a mechanism, it's it's one that's not yet known for a drug that's actually been studied. 
uh, quite well. But that being said, I think, as Joe already pointed out, just because you don't have a mechanism to explain something doesn't mean that there isn't one. Um, one of the things that's been postulated is that because of the local um, persistence of the drug in the vessel wall that could lead to vessel wall toxicity, some sort of low-grade uh, inflammatory response, that that in a patient who has cardiovascular disease could uh, lead uh, in some way to an increased all-cause mortality. Now, that's purely speculation. Nobody has any data to support that, but that's one thing that's been thrown out there. But it could very well be something that we've never even thought of. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I tried to look into this, and they had an oncologist at the Viva meeting. And so this is used, like I said before, most of the times Paclitaxel is used for cancer. It's for lethal cancer, so it prolongs life by a short time. But you'd probably never be able to pick up a delayed effect like this. The exception is breast cancer. And I think that for breast cancer, it's so effective that any other influence it might have on mortality is drowned out by the beneficial effect it has on reducing breast cancer mortality. But I, I did a lot of research and it looks to me like at least there is some evidence that women who've had Paclitaxel that survive have an increased incidence of arrhythmias and possibly congestive heart failure. So this is purely speculative on my point, but but if you look at the subset of patients we're putting Paclitaxel in, they have a different risk profile than breast cancer patients, right? They're likely older, they all have PAD, and it could be that there's some delayed cardiac effect that we just haven't seen in, in breast cancer patients because their risk pro factor profile is different. So, you know, that's, that's purely speculation. Other people have said it might be immune in some way, but you'd think if that were the case, I guess if we get the patient level data and we get the cause of death for as many patients as possible, we might be able to figure that out if there's some immunogenic response, but that seems kind of different. That seems weird to me because you'd think you'd start seeing pulmonary problems or or renal problems or something related to to the immunogenic mechanism. So it's not obvious. I think that's what that's the deniers actually that was what they focused on the most is we just don't understand understand this. But I mean in the history of medicine there's plenty of things we haven't understood until we figure them out, right? So it's I think the statistical data are pretty compelling to at least put a pause to this while we try to sort it out. The UK is putting together a panel the SBS, Kim Hodgson, I think, is in charge of that, and they've, they've contacted a pretty well-known statistical group to start looking at the stats part of it. But I think whoever does this analysis needs to have access to as much patient-level data as they can get, and there needs to be very strict conflict of interest um, guidelines so that there's no interference with the analysis. What's the mechanism for that? I mean, is the are the uh, industry partners volunteering that data, or is it available through the FDA, or how, how do they get the access to the patient-level data? The FDA, of course, already has the patient-level data okay. from the pivotal trials that were submitted as part of the PMAs or post-market uh, studies that they were obligated to do. So FDA actually has some of that data. My understanding, at least for the, the, the Viva Leaders Forum, is that uh, most of the industry sponsors have agreed to share their patient level data so that hopefully the Viva group will be able to do as much of a non-conflicted, transparent, and independent analysis. Uh, they intend to hire some independent statisticians as well uh, to look at this, that, that hopefully they'll be able to, to, to get to the answer to determine whether or not this is a real signal, uh, again, using patient level data. And then the other thing that people and, and, and a lot of the deniers have been asking for as well is not just the intention to treat analysis, but the as treated analysis. Because a lot of the patients, for, for example, in the Zilver PTX study, just due to the design of that study, if you had a suboptimal or failed angioplasty, then you were randomized and possibly got the paclitaxel device. But when you're analyzed on an intention to treat basis, you're still analyzed as if you were in the angioplasty arm without the drug. And so that's been one one criticism. So so. Both analyses are going to have to be done, the intention to treat and also the actual as-treated analysis. And if I'm thinking about that right, the, the direction that would have likely crossed over, that may actually make the data stronger, just because more patients who might have had events might have actually gotten exposure to drug. Yeah, you'd think that, uh, at least to me, it would seem like that would have, um, if anything, blunted the response. The fact that it's still there is concerning to me.
Yep. There's a big debate about this because the standard way for evidence-based medicine is you do intention to treat analysis because it's the least bias. Once you deviate from that, there's many different types of bias that can creep in. And so there's a big debate. I think most people have agreed it needs to be done both ways. But if you think about it, a lot of the people that didn't get drug initially got treated for restenosis, so they got drug eventually. So to actually calculate all that out, you'd have to look at the times I guess you could do that if the data is available, but when did the initial treatment happen and when were they retreated and then got exposed to drug? And depending on how long the follow-up is, you may not have had enough follow-up to see that there's a difference, right? Because this didn't show up until the two-year point. That's true. It didn't show up in 30 days. It didn't show up at one year. And the follow-up is really a key point, in particular when there's this question of mortality and none of the studies were initially designed to look at, at the mortality issue or power to. because the a lot the way a lot of these clinical trials are done if somebody dies and there's a a little abstract or synopsis that's written by a clinical research nurse it's not entirely clear always exactly what the cause of death is the CEC in the trial may just say well it happened 5 years later it's clearly unrelated and then it gets dismissed and not necessarily followed up on and now to go back retrospectively and to look at what the cause of death in all these patients were would be very difficult or probably impossible because a lot of that data is just simply not there. So so even going back on these as treated or trying to get additional granularity about the mortalities, it, I think it's going to be difficult and, and not necessarily going to provide any additional clarity. Yeah, I think I talked to a bunch of people about that. I mean, most of the largest trials of pretty much everything look at all cause mortality because you can get that. It's concrete, right? You're either alive or you're dead. Trying to get, if you've been involved in studies, like we've been in a bunch of peripheral studies and trying to, to the company, if, you're, if it's a sponsored trial, always wants you to be as granular as possible. So you're, you try to get the old records and it's very difficult. Um, and this is something you would never see in practice, right? Because we treat PAD patients and we all know they have strokes and heart attacks. And if it's not happening early, most of us would never have attributed, uh, you know, a two or three or five year death for something to to the study, right? If I put a stent in somebody four years ago, I would assume that their cardiac or cerebrovascular event had more to do with disease progression. That would be normal. It's not deny. It's not uh, being dishonest. It's just that's the nature of the patients we treat. So this would be hard to pick up um, any other way. I think that, but I think that's the reason that people use all cause mortality because it's it's black and white, right? And is there anything else that you guys learned at the, you know, Vascar Leaders Forum uh, that, that you can share with us just as far as details on this? Or And I think we've discussed a lot of what was discussed. And at the Leaders Forum was actually a pretty, you know, comprehensive and, and deep dive into the controversy and the potential issues. Uh, they did have uh, input uh, not only from the people who have been involved in the peripheral trials. Katsanos actually presented, you know, his his paper again to the group, um, and there were statisticians, we had people from industry, we had basic scientists who are experts in in, in uh, 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 vessel wall biology as well as paclitaxel, and they even had uh, oncologists who use paclitaxel uh, in their practice. So I thought it was a, a pretty well-rounded uh, 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 approach to the issue and the and the controversy, and you know it was really striking to me, I think the most striking thing was that I, I think there were probably a lot of people there who tended to be more in the denier camp and wanted to dismiss this or may have had an agenda connected to that because of, you know, whether they're from industry or they are involved in some of these trials. But what was really impressive to me was that at the end of two days of a lot of discussion that the issue couldn't be dismissed. So for me, that was powerful as well, as well as taking the deep dive into what information is out there. You know, I have to say, Darren, I think that um, you came back from that meeting and your perspective was 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 influenced by the time you did there, you know, um, which was sort of powerful. It didn't come out right away. That's what was interesting. It was, uh, what, it was a one and a half or almost two day meeting. And the FDA didn't present, I think, until Saturday morning. And then the way they presented it at first was a little bit, at least for me, seemed vague. And then Mark Shermerhorn asked a question, and I asked a question, a couple other people asked questions. And then they said that they had looked at the, they did an initial look at the data they had, right? Because they, the paper was published in December, 
and then people had to read it. And so they wouldn't have had time actually to probably get data from, from all the studies that Kat Sanos looked at. But they had access to the, I think there were five pivotal trials in the US, so they had all that data. And they actually said, well, yes, we did an analysis and it seems to confirm these findings. I think that that seemed to change the perception a little bit in the audience, at least. Well, wait a minute, this is this is not just one statistician looking at it with pretty complicated statistics that a lot of us don't understand. This is actually different, slightly different data. So it's related to some of the trials, but the FDA again has more granular data. And so that, to me, that was the biggest news of importance I got from that meeting. And I thought it was actually well structured. They did have a lot of um, uh, input from people from all different angles, from people that were in the trials, from people that um, were PIs, say it's some basic science people. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I, I agree with uh, with Joe. I think it really at, towards the end of the meeting when uh, it became apparent that FDA uh, saying in their own independent analysis that they've documented uh, also that there's a similar signal in their findings, that that really swayed uh, the group quite a bit and really changed the, the tone in terms of uh, what you know how much people were inclined to believe that this is a real issue. So then I guess this is a question for the two, both Dr. Mills and Dr. Schneider. What role, if any, does, does uh, uh, Pacotaxel have now in the periphery? Is there, is there any piece that you use in practice or is it dead? For me, I'm, I'm very concerned about this because I do believe now hearing from the experts, seeing the available uh, data and analyses that are out there, hearing from the FDA, uh, that there likely is a real mortality signal and that we're treating clodicants who, of course, don't have life or limb-threatening problems that we're treating, and that to, to introduce a therapy that may increase their risk of death is is really, in my mind, not really a tenable thing that we should be doing. So uh, I agree with the FDA's statement that that whenever possible, we should use alternative therapies right now until we get more uh, granularity uh, uh, on this issue. I mean, our we really have an obligation to to do no harm, and 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 if we're introducing a therapy that increases the risk of all cause mortality in our patients, then we're not doing the right thing. Now, the the question you can ask is like, well, that was all clodicants largely that were in the analysis. Clodication makes sense. We don't want to introduce a therapy that that could be associated with a risk of mortality, but critical limb ischemia is probably different, right? Because those patients already have a high risk of death. They're already facing uh, 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 limb threat and potential limb loss, and so is the risk benefit equation different in in CLI? I, I'm not convinced. I think that that any time, and in fact, I may have some more concerns in CLI as well. Uh, I think that any time. You're going to pull a device off the shelf and put it in a patient. If it's known to potentially increase their mortality, uh, it's probably not the right thing to do. And I think the other thing with CLI, especially in patients with wounds, there's some real concerns about downstream paclitaxel effects because there can be distal embolization and downstream effects that could potentially actually impair wound healing. And in certain trials, like the Impact Deep trial, for instance, they actually stopped the trial because of concern about an increased incidence of amputations in the patient group who were receiving the drug. So for me, uh, you know, I'm kind of now totally switched to the other side of the fence where I think the role of paclitaxel on the periphery going forward, unless these findings can really be disproven, is, is, is almost none now. Dr. Mills, how do you feel about that? I think for me, when the paper first came out, we had intensive discussions in our group, and I was on Twitter with this somewhat, and I, I had decided to stop using them in claudicants almost immediately because, again, most of the benefit has been in TLR. Nobody's really shown benefit in walking distance for claudicants. But at least at the time, I thought, well, the CLI patients, which is mostly what I treat, are different, and if they have complex lesions and I'm trying to get something that stays open long enough to heal their wounds, you know, it may not apply to these patients. So I was still using it sparingly in, in chronic limb-threatening ischemia patients. But then the more I thought about it, it's, it's unclear. I mean, so those patients on the one hand aren't going to live as long, so maybe you won't see the effect. I mean, most CLTI patients have, what, 50% five-year mortality? But it, on the other hand, depending on what the mechanism of this is, it could actually have a more profound effect. So like, it's so somewhat easier in CLTI patients because most of what we treat there is tibial disease. 
So we don't really have drug coated tibial balloons. And then if you need to use a spot stent, you can use coronary um, serolimus stents, which is, I've done that a couple times now. So um, for me, I've kind of put it on hold. I mean, to me, if it turns out we get patient level data and find some confounders that can explain this, and it turns out it's not really correct and that we can't find a mechanism and maybe it was all, maybe it's dose related so we go to lower dose stuff. And no harm, no foul. In six months or a year, we can go back. But I'm concerned enough. I'm, I pretty much stopped using it, I think. I just think in, in, from the issue of safety, I mean, one of the things that was brought up is maybe you should just have an intense discussion with the patient and let them choose. But this is even hard for physicians to figure out. So not to be paternalistic, but how is the average patient going to understand? If you tell them their TLR is better, increased risk of death, I mean, what rational human being is going to choose TLR, right? I'd rather have a second procedure in a year or two than, than die in two to five years. So I, I think that discussion that was brought up by some of the basic science people was pretty unrealistic. I just can't imagine having that discussion with patients unless there were very tangible benefits. Like if you discuss EVAR versus open, right? You can talk about 30 day mortality, you can talk about one year mortality, you can talk about wound complications, bowel obstruction and so forth, right? But you can't have that discussion at least I can't with with a with a drug or device that actually just reduces TLR. So for me, I pretty much put it on hold, at least with Paclitaxel, until this gets clarified. And I don't think, to me, that's the safest thing. That's what I would want for my own family. I think. I agree with Joe that that it would be a very difficult discussion to have with patients, especially since we already don't even understand the mechanism when we start talking to them about this. But I'd like to point out that somebody just shared with me just a couple days ago that there is a, a uh, law firm now running an advertisement in the United States uh, encouraging patients who have been uh, exposed to paclitaxel devices in the periphery to contact them. So the concept that patients may not be able to understand this, I mean, patients are going to start hearing about this. So I do think that we have to be uh, concerned if we do use it in patients, there probably has to be uh, some um, uh, informed consent process uh, with them. I'm just not sure exactly how to do it, and it's one that we don't always take because when we treat a patient, we tell them, well, we've got multiple tools to, available to us. We'll see what we find when we get in there. We'll try to pick the best device for you and uh, try to, to fix your claudication or save your limb. But now to introduce this discussion of that we may use a drug that that potentially in three to five years could slightly increase your risk of all-cause mortality, that's a difficult discussion to ask. And if, you know, if I were a patient and somebody started having that discussion with me, I'd probably tell them that I probably didn't want that device. I think that's almost an impossible discussion to have. I really do. I, I, that, that was the recommendation that if you do use it, you specifically put in your, there was even one person who I won't, I don't remember exactly, well, I remember who it was, but I won't mention the individual, but just said, well, we just make a template and put that in your pre-op consent that we discussed this with it. But that, to me, that doesn't meet the, it's just because you have it in a templated note doesn't mean that you really understood it. And I think this is so complex. I just can't imagine how I'd have that discussion. And I think I'm pretty good at talking to patients after taking care of them for so long. But I, I think for me, it's easier to uh, revert to what we were doing before, before we had drug elution and, and go from there. Definitely. Well, this has been a fantastic review, and as soon as new findings come out, we'll be sure to update the Audible Bleeding listeners. So uh, thank you, Dr. Schneider and Dr. Mills, for taking time out of your Sunday to help uh, break this down for our listeners. We uh, really appreciate it. We'll have links to both the uh, initial paper and the FDA's updated statement and recommendations on our show notes. So if anyone hasn't seen those yet, uh, please check that out. And if you're not connected to the vascular surgery uh, tweeting community, uh, <laughs> Dr. Mills and, and Dr. Schneider are both uh, all rock stars in that community, and, and uh, you can learn a lot from them just by following them on Twitter. So I highly encourage you to uh, search them out and find them. We'll, we'll include their Twitter handles on the, on the show notes as well. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, guys. We are Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. You can find us on social media at Audible Bleeding or online at audiblebleeding.com.